Shalom, this is Annie Yahoo. Uh, this is uh, the beginning of a series of videos in which I hope to do a commentary on the Gospel of Thomas. Now, before I do a commentary on the Gospel of Thomas, I would like you to understand that there are two Gospel of Thomases that exist, and I'm referring not to the one that most people, not most, but many people think of, the infancy gospel. I'm not referring to the infancy gospel of Thomas. Rather, I'm referring to the sayings gospel of Thomas, the one that was found in the so-called Gnostic, um, well, it was a Gnostic library but not all the texts themselves were uh, of Gnostic origin. But so that is the Gospel of Thomas. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, that is the Gospel of Thomas that um, I would like to do a commentary on. So the way this is going to work is basically I'm going to just kind of go back and forth finding different uh, sayings of the Messiah in the Gospel of Thomas that I feel compelled to do a commentary on. Eventually I hope to do the entire thing, but for now I feel I'm more inspired and more I can better analyze the sayings if I just kind of go about it in a seemingly random way rather than rather than in order with that said this is the uh, the first the first three sayings of the gospel of thomas there are 114 sayings altogether um but with that said i will now go to the first three sayings of the gospel of thomas the reason, um, well, actually, primarily, this video is only about one saying, but it's going to discuss three sayings which further clarify the one saying. All right, so with that said, um, I'm going to read, this is saying number 19. Um, so it says... Yehushua said, Blessed is he who came into being before he came into being. If you become my disciples and listen to my words, these stones will minister to you. For there are five trees for you in paradise, which remain undisturbed, summer and winter, and whose leaves do not fall. Whoever becomes acquainted with them will not experience death. Uh, I'm going to end this video, actually. I just decided to end this video because um, to make this a more powerful commentary, I want to read some different scriptures from the canonical, the so, you know, the, what everyone accepts as canonical. Um, that being, you know, Gospel of Matthew, stuff like that. I want to read from those different parallels, and I didn't have those prepared. So, because without those parallels, many people will reject what the Gospel of Thomas has to say. But if I include those parallels, then people will be more open to this message. So, with that said, I'm going to end this video now, and stay tuned for the first uh, video after this introduction video in which I do a commentary on the five trees of paradise thing. Thank you and Shalom. Shalom, this is Annie Yahoo. This is the first in a series of videos in which I will be doing a commentary on the Gospel of Thomas. In the previous video, I was beginning to do my commentary by and I started that by reading one of the sayings 
However, midway during reading the saying, I decided that I wanted to include some things that I hadn't intended on including in this commentary. So I couldn't continue the video because I needed to further prepare. So I decided to end the video right then and there and make it an introductory video instead. But so now I'm going to do the commentary of part, um, uh, the commentary of the one I was going to do previously, and that is saying number 19 of the Gospel of Thomas. So I read it in the previous video, but I'm going to read it again for the sake of this commentary. Saying number 19 of the Gospel of Thomas, it reads, Yahushua said, Blessed is he who came into being before he came into being. If you become my disciples and listen to my words, these stones will minister to you. For there are five trees for you in paradise, which remain undisturbed summer and winter, and whose leaves do not fall. Whoever becomes acquainted with them will not experience death. Now, let's discuss this first part of it. It says, Blessed is he who came into being before he came into being. What does that mean? Well, as I said in the previous video, throughout these commentaries, I want to show you certain parallels in what you accept as scripture to support this commentary in the Gospel of Thomas. Because I've encountered a lot of Christians who I read something from the Gospel of Thomas, or they read something from the Gospel of Thomas, and they find it really shocking and absurd, and they reject, they say, okay, this is definitely not scripture. But then I proceed to show them, well, what about this in the Gospel of Matthew, or the Gospel of John, which says the exact same thing. And then they're like, oh, wait, wait a minute. See, they take it back, because they don't realize that the Gospel of Thomas essentially differs in no detail whatsoever with the theology and ethical moral teaching of the New Testament and the rest of the, the scriptures, the rest of the scriptures that they accept. Now, I believe the Gospel of Thomas is scripture, and I know that many people watching this video, well, I say many, whoever watches this video will likely not accept the Gospel of Thomas as scripture, but I this commentary is from the perspective that the Gospel of Thomas is scripture. Um, so, so now I'm going to read from, uh, this is the letter of Paul to the Ephesians, and this is a, a parallel. Uh, so, this, from, uh, verses 4 to 6. According as he hath chosen us in him, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. So, I believe, I'm convinced that when it says, blessed is he who came into being before he came into being, it's referring to predestination here. So blessed is the one who is elect, the one who is chosen by God before the foundation of the world. Next, if you become my disciples and listen to my words, these stones will minister to you. What does this refer to? Well, in Matthew chapter 3, verse 9, it reads, And think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you, that God is able, to, able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Right there. Stones. Hold on a moment. Okay, so right there. Right there, that's stones ministering to God. Okay, that's 
God raising up stones as children of Abraham. Um, now, what is significant about that is that uh, that Messiah there is quoting, well, not quoting, referencing the um, one of the Jeremiah Apocrypha, so-called Apocrypha, from the book specifically called Fourth Baruch. There's First Baruch, Second Baruch, Third Baruch, and Fourth Baruch. Now, Fourth Baruch is considered scripture canonical in the Ethiopian church, the Ethiopian Orthodox Christians accepted as scripture. And in in Fourth Baruch, it says this, it says, But Jeremiah said to them, Be silent and weep not, for they cannot kill me until I describe for you everything I saw. And he said to them, Bring a stone here to me. And he set it up and said, Light of the ages, make this stone to become like me in appearance, and I until I have described to Baruch and Abimelech everything I saw. Then the stone, by God's command, took on the appearance of Jeremiah. And they were stoning the stone, supposing that it was Jeremiah. But Jeremiah delivered to Baruch and to Abimelech all the mysteries he had seen, and forthwith he stood in the midst of the people, desiring to complete his ministry. Then the stone cried out, saying, O foolish children of Israel, why do you stone me, supposing that I am Jeremiah? Behold, Jeremiah is standing in your midst. And when they saw him, immediately they rushed upon him with many stones, and his ministry was fulfilled. And when Baruch and Abimelech came, they buried him, and taking the stone, they placed it on his tomb and inscribed it thus, this is a stone that was the ally of Jeremiah. So that right there is an explicit uh, reference by the Messiah to Fourth Baruch. But so that further helps clarify to us what the Gospel of Thomas is saying right here. It says, if you become my disciples and listen to my words, these stones will minister to you. Right there, that stone ministered to Jeremiah prophet because he was a disciple of God and another um, let's see here there was another reference that I might have forgotten to include here but basically um, okay I think I have it so the other reference, um, ah yes, the, the mountain of Matthew chapter 21. So it says, Jesus answered, Matthew chapter 21 verse uh, 21. It says, Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, if you have faith and doubt not, ye shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if you shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. And all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. Okay. So that right there further supports what the Gospel of Thomas is saying, that uh, if you become my disciples and listen to my words, then the the elements will minister to you and you will be able to be manipulate them so as to benefit and praise his holy name. Now, the next part. For there are five trees for you in paradise which remain undisturbed summer and winter and whose leaves do not fall. Whoever becomes acquainted with them, will not experience death. Um, so, okay, so now I'm going to read to you from the Book of Enoch, which I accept as scripture. Now, the only thing is 
that um, I'm reading from the a book, the version of the Book of Enoch where, that uh, has a little bit of a different different numbering system, so I can't give you exact references. And it also has um, a little bit of a different order because it follows the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, rather than solely the um, the regular uh, translation, rather than just Charles, it follows the Dead Sea Scrolls. So with that said, I'm going to read it. Behold the earth, and give heed its works, which take place upon it from first to last. How nothing changes in how all the works of God appear. Behold the signs of summer and the signs of winter, how the whole earth is filled with water, dew, and clouds, and rain pour out and lie upon it. Behold how all the trees wither and shed all their leaves, except fourteen trees whose leaves remain, which do not lose their leaves, until two to three years pass till the new comes. And again, behold the signs of summer, how the sun burns and you seek shade and shelter from before it on the burning earth. And so you cannot tread on the earth or on the rocks by reason of its heat. Behold how the leaves of all the trees blossom, covering them with green leaves and bear fruit for honor and praise. So give heed to all these works, and recognize how he that lives forever has done all these works. Year after year all his works go on forever, and all his works serve him and change not. But according as God has ordained, so it is done. Now, I'm getting a little close to the 15 minute mark, so I'm going to end it here and continue this commentary in... Part 2. Thank you and Shalom. Shalom, this is Annie Yahoo. This is part 2 in my commentary on saying number 19 of the Gospel of Thomas, the saying of the five trees. Um, so, in the previous video, I had just read from the Book of Enoch. Now, allow me to analyze that a little bit. So, comparing to the um, comparing to the Gospel of Thomas, I'll read it again. For there are five trees for you in paradise, which remain undisturbed summer and winter, and whose leaves do not fall. Whoever becomes acquainted with them will not experience death. So, first of all, we see the benefit of the five trees is that we don't experience death. Now, in context, when we read the book of Enoch, this passage is basically saying, the book of Enoch passage, that is, is that observe all these things of nature which obey God, and yet you do not obey God. So, change your lifestyle, imitate the nature which obeys me, or you will not be saved. So it uses... It basically says, follow these things, uh, imitate them, and then you shall be saved. Now, from, uh, from what I was reading near the end, it says, um, Recognize how he that lives forever has done all these works. Year after year all his works go on thus forever, and all his works serve him and change not, but according as God has ordained, so it is done. This refers to e eternal, unending, so you will not experience death. And <coughs> also, um, also, whoever becomes acquainted with them will not experience certain things. For instance, um, all right, so the benefits of the five trees. Now, these five trees, they are, they're, they're 
they're what they're called evergreen trees. In the Gospel of Thomas, these five trees are evergreen trees. In the Gospel of Thomas, there are 14 different kinds of evergreen trees. Scientifically, that is an accurate statement. Um, so, Enoch describes these evergreen trees and how they don't lose their leaves either in summer or in winter. Now, when we read scripture, summer and winter refer to various uh, parabolic sayings of our life here now. Um, so, when we read when we read winter, um, that refers to the season of bitterness and where there is not much there. In the Shepherd of Hermas, during winter, it's not very clear to the people of this world who is righteous and who is unrighteous. It's very uh, blurry and fuzzy, according to the Shepherd of Hermas. I don't have the exact reference, but that's what the Shepherd of Hermas says. Um, in fact, I can quickly read it. Um, Shepherd. I'm doing a search winter. Okay, so this is the third uh, parable or similitude of the Shepherd Hermes, and it reads, He showed me many trees having no leaves, but withered, as it seemed to me, for all were alike. And he said to me, Do you see those trees? I see, sir, I replied, that all are alike and withered. He answered me and said, These trees which you see are those who dwell in this world. Why then, sir, I said, are they withered, as it were, and alike? Because, he said, um, neither are the righteous manifest in this life, nor sinners, but they are alike, for this life is a winter to the righteous, and they do not manifest themselves, because they dwell with sinners. For as in winter trees that have cast their leaves are alike, and it is not seen which are dead and which are living. So in this world neither do the righteous show themselves, nor sinners, but all are like uh, to one to another. Now the next saying, saying number, I mean, the next parable, parable four. He showed me again many trees, some budding and others withered. And he said to me, do you see these trees? I see, sir, I replied, some putting forth buds and others withered. Those, he said, which are budding are the righteous who are to live in the world to come. For the coming world is the summer of the righteous, but the winter of sinners. When, therefore, the mercy of the Lord shines forth, then shall they be made manifest who are the servants of God, and all men shall be made manifest. For as in summer the fruits of each individual tree appear, and it is ascertained of what sort they are, so also the fruit Fruits of the righteous shall be manifest, and all who have been fruitful in the world in that world shall be made known. But the heathen and sinners, like the withered trees which you saw, will be found to be those who have been withered and unfruitful in that world, and shall be burnt as wood, and made manifest, because their actions were evil during their lives. For the sinners shall be consumed because they sinned and did not repent, and the heathen shall be burned because they knew not him who created them. Do you therefore bear fruit that in that summer your fruit may be known? And refrain from much business, and you will never sin, for they who are occupied with many business with much business commit also many sins, being distracted about their affairs, and not at all serving their Lord. How then he continued can such a one ask and obtain anything from the Lord if he serve him not? They who serve him shall obtain their requests, but they who serve him not shall receive nothing. And in the performance even of a single action, a man can serve the Lord, for his mind will not be perverted from the Lord, but he will serve him and having a pure mind, having a pure mind. If therefore you do these things, you shall be able to bear fruit for the life to come, and everyone who will do these things shall bear fruit. So, that is a very long reading I just gave you, but that very clearly connects to what we see here. In the book of Enoch, I mentioned how there's a signs, it says, Behold the signs of summer and the signs of winter. 
that. It is a call to observe nature and uh, draw from it moral guidelines and moral principles. In um, now, notice in verse, um, excuse me. In, notice later on in this passage that I read of Enoch, it says, "And again, behold the signs of summer, how the sun burns, and you seek shade and shelter from before it on the burning earth, and you cannot tread on the earth or on the." Uh, rocks by reason of its heat. This right there connects to what the shepherd hermits just said, how summer, the well, summer is the day of judgment, okay? Summer is when God's wrath is poured out upon the earth. Only the trees that are green and blossoming are the trees that are accepted by God. And so these trees, to go under you, in order to not be burned, you need to be within these trees. You need to be under these trees. Seek the shade and shelter from these trees. So with that right there, you see these five trees are given to us in both summer and winter. So in the Day of Judgment, these five trees will be for us our protection. These five trees will be our shade and shelter from the heat. Everyone else will be burned because they do not have these five trees. They do not, they, didn't, they did not take shade or shelter in with, with these five trees. So they are outside of these five trees. They do not have them. And they are burned because of it. And it also says in Enoch, Behold how the leaves of all the trees blossom, covering them with green leaves, and bear fruit for honor and praise. So the fruit of the trees, the five trees, the fruit is for honor and praise of God. So this refers to, these five trees are moral representatives. They represent certain moral things. The moral commandments, the moral laws. So, bears fruit for honor and praise. Um, okay, so also, not only are the five trees, however, existing in summer, but these five trees are also in winter. Now, when I read The Shepherd of Hermas, winter refers to the life here on earth, here and now. So, this is amazing because we see that these five trees are also to be received and they exist in this present earth. Now remember, in summer you had to take the shade and shelter of the trees or else you would not be saved from the heat of God the wrath of God. In winter, before it's summer, before the judgment of God has come, to, to receive the fruit of God, to bear the fruit of God, you have to, the, the only trees you can go to that have fruit are these five trees. These are the only trees which give fruit to us. There is no other source of fruit. So this is very clear that if you want fruit, if you want something, if you want life, a tree of life, not of death, if you want the living fruit, then you need to go to these five trees, according to the Gospel of Thomas, because it is only these five trees which are, which are uh, in winter. So, I'm getting close to the 15 minute mark, but I am going to finish this part two. There's going to be a part three, but the finishing part two is an amazing revelation. So, again, for there are five trees for you in paradise, which remain undisturbed summer and winter, and whose leaves do not fall. 
whoever becomes acquainted with them will not experience death. So the five trees are connected to if you become acquainted with these five trees, then you will be saved. You will not go to hell. You will have eternal life. So many people have no clue what the, these five trees are. But if you read scripture, it couldn't be any clearer. But the revelation is very controversial because of the implications. Uh, the implications are drastic and major. These five trees, I'm about to declare to you what the meaning is. The five trees are the five books of the law of Moses. Now, Notice, for there are five trees for you in paradise, which remain undisturbed summer and winter, and whose leaves do not fall. This reads similar to Matthew, uh, Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5, which, which reads, um, which reads this, think not that I have I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments, and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of God. But whoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Um, so, that right there um, refers to the eternality of the law of Moses. And now I'm going to continue this in, uh, I'm going to finish this in part three of this commentary. Thank you and shalom. Shalom, this is Annie Yahoo. This is part three in my commentary on saying number 19 of the Gospel of Thomas, the saying of the five trees. So, I just read in the previous video how the law of Moses um, will never be abolished. The law of Moses and the prophets, uh, every commandment of the law and the prophets uh, must be taught because whoever breaks one of these commandments, the least of these commandments of the law or prophets, and teach others to do so, will be called least in the kingdom of God. And until heaven and earth would disappear, the law will never disappear in this mortal life. Now, since heaven and earth will last until the very end of this life, that means the law of Moses will last until the very end of this life. I mentioned how the, the Law of Moses is the only answer for the five trees of paradise, because this is the only sufficient explanation to cover all meanings. These are the five things. However, there was a man named Philo, a Jew, who offered an allegorical interpretation of Genesis, which has some parallels to what we've just said. And it, he describes that the tree, there were five trees in the Garden, uh, Garden of Eden, which is often referred to as paradise. And so that is the tree of life, tree of immortality, tree of knowledge, tree of comprehension, and tree of knowledge of good and evil. One might also seek to compare the five tr trees that Philo mentioned and put one of each tree to the uh, five books of the Law of Moses. Um, knowledge of good and evil would probably be the book of Genesis. 
Now the th this is a just a guess here. I I haven't really compared these five trees to to the five books of Moses. Uh, these five trees of Philo, that is. But so we could say that Genesis is the knowledge of good and evil, Exodus is comprehension, Leviticus is knowledge, Numbers is immortality, and Deuteronomy is the tree of life. Now, I just want to say briefly that the book of Deuteronomy in its current form I do not accept as canonical. Because the original book of Deuteronomy is was very different than what we have today. But for all um, for some simple purposes, the book of Deuteronomy would be the tree of life. In other words, the fifth book of the law of Moses. Um, so so I, I'll read from the Gospel of Thomas again. For there are five trees for you in paradise which remain undisturbed summer and winter and whose leaves do not fall. Whoever becomes acquainted with them will not experience death. When we look at all of the Messiah's sayings, it is very clear that these five trees must refer to the Law of Moses. There is no other explanation that fits this saying, this parable of Messiah. Um, so now we, ha we have the vision. I mean, we have the interpretation of this saying. However, the implications, as I said, are very controversial, because that means we have to keep the Law of Moses, because the Law of Moses is here for this life, the winter, and the summer. And in order to be saved from the wrath of God, we must seek the shade and shelter of the Law of Moses. And during this life, the only fruit that is there for us to receive is the fruit of the law of Moses. Okay? So that is a very significant thing right there. Now, allow me to continue. Throughout the Gospel of Thomas, the the author Thomas the Apostle arranged the sayings in such a way that the previous saying and the following saying are both intended to support and further enhance the message of the current saying being dis being read. So, with that said, let's read the saying before. Saying number 18, the disciples said to Jesus, tell us how our end will be. Je Jesus said, have you discovered then the beginning that you will look for the end? For where the beginning is, there will the end be. Blessed is he who will take his place in the beginning. He will know the end and will not experience death. First of all, this right here also talks about experiencing death, the connection. Now, since we, this is, this is enhancing saying number 19. It talks about how, for, first of all, he mentions, uh, Discovering the beginning and looking for the end. Finding the beginning, you will also find the end. As in Gospel Thomas saying number 19, Blessed is he who came into being before he came into being. The predestination. Um, so, looking at the very beginning, you, you must seek the beginning. You must seek the predestination, the election, the salvation, and also the the thing that it has existed ever from the beginning, which is also the end of life. The beginning and end of life are the commandments of God. The law of Moses sums up every single commandment that could ever be known by two commandments. Love your neighbor as yourself, and love God. With all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. So, that right there encompasses all of morality. Five law, books of the Law of Moses, therefore, the morality, the laws of morality in the Law of Moses, not the Law of Moses itself, but the morality it teaches, is founded in the beginning of all things, and it's the end of all things. It's the eternal nature. It lasts forever. And in, in order to... Um, 
have stones minister to us and things like that, we have to discover the beginning. We have to discover the law of Moses to, to have this. Now, the following saying, saying 20, reads, The disciples said to Yahushua, Tell us what the kingdom of heaven is like. He said to them, It is like a mustard seed, the smallest of all seeds, but when it falls on tilled soil, it produces a great plant and becomes a shelter for birds of the sky. Right there, it talks about what the kingdom of heaven is like. So, the kingdom of heaven... Um, is also in reference to saying number 19. The kingdom of heaven is the five trees of paradise, which, um, if we become acquainted with them, we will not experience death. Also, so he said, it is like a mustard seed, the smallest of all seeds, but when it just falls on tilled soil, it produces a great plant. What is the tilled soil? The tilled soil is our hearts. Now, our hearts, untilled, represent the wicked and those who refuse to repent, who are not open to God's love and mercy, revelation, uh, the revelation of God. They are not open to a change of life and manner of living. But the, the tilled soil refers to the person who uh, rends their heart, changes their manner of living, and then the seed of the law of Moses, or the mustard seed, is planted into their heart, and then it produces a great plant. The five trees are, are within you, and then, as it's, here's another connection, becomes a shelter for birds of the sky. The shelter refers back to saying 19. Um, which, as I quoted from the book of Enoch, the trees in summer are for shade and shelter. So once again, the five trees of the law of Moses are for shade and shelter for us. You, as an offshoot of these five trees, uh, as a representative of the law of Moses, when you teach others the law of Moses, the true righteousness, the way of righteousness, you yourself become a shelter for, for birds of the sky. The birds of the sky represent um, other disciples that become converted by you. So now those two connect. Now we're going to read... Um, Alright, uh, saying number 18 I read already. Um, so that says again, tell us how our end will be, Yahushua said, have you discovered in the beginning that you will look for the end? For where the beginning is, there will the end be, blessed is he who will take his place in the beginning. He will know the end and will not experience death. That connects to saying 17 and saying 19 of what we're discussing. Saying 17 says, Yahushua said, I shall give you what no eye has seen, and what no ear has heard, and what no hand has touched, and what has never occurred to the human mind. This is supposed to further enhance saying number 18. Tell us how our end will be. Have you discovered then the beginning that you look for the end? So the beginning and the end um, are... That is what no eye has seen and no ear has heard, and what no hand has touched, and what has never occurred to the human mind. That is going to be revealed to us. And take his place, blessed is he who takes his place in the beginning, or he will know the end and will not experience death. To the no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no hand has touched, what has never occurred to the human mind, that is referring to the eternal life that will be given to us if we are truly followers of God. In saying number 19, this also enhances saying 18. And so it says, again, blessed is he who came to being before he came into being. If you become my disciples and listen to my words, these stones will minister to you. For there are five trees for you in paradise, which remain undisturbed summer and winter, and whose leaves do not fall. Whoever becomes acquainted with them will not experience death. These five trees, the Law of Moses, 
um, are the uh, beginning and the end, what no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no hand has touched, and never occurred to the human mind, the the uh, rewards of the law of Moses. So this connects us to this. This is the rewards of the law of Moses. And hopefully I can do the very last part. Um, so saying 20, the disciples said to, to Yahushua, tell us what the king of heaven is like, the mustard seed. So again, the five trees refer to the mustard seed. Um, the smallest of all seeds, when it falls on tilled soil, it produces a great plant and becomes a shelter for birds of the sky. This is, I, I can't really say too much more about what I've already said about that, but um, saying 20, uh, one, refer, says, whom are your disciples like? He said, they are like children who have settled in a field which is not theirs. When the owners of the field come, they will say, let us have back our field. They undress in their presence in order to let them have back their field and give it back to them. Therefore, I say to you, if the owner of a house knows that the thief is coming, he will begin his vigil before he comes and will not let him into his house of his dominion to carry away his goods. You then be on your guard against the world. Arm yourselves with great strength, lest the robbers find a way to come to you. For the difficulty which you expect will surely materialize. Let there be among you a man of understanding. When the grain ripened, he came quickly with his sickle in his hand and reaped it. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. Um, I don't really have time to further discuss the this connection to the five trees. But I will tell you that later on I will be doing video, hopefully on saying 20 and saying 21 and things like that. So until then, uh, this is all for now about the five trees. Thank you and shalom. Shalom, this is Annie Yahoo. This is, uh, this is my commentary on saying number 114 of the Gospel of Thomas, the very last saying, which is perhaps the most controversial saying of, of all the sayings of the Gospel of Thomas. And many, for some strange reason, they don't have any evidence for this, manuscript or otherwise, that this saying, they believe this saying is an addition to the text and not part of the original, but that is absurd. The idea is that it's supposed to be a bit challenging it's supposed to be a bit controversial. That's the look at every saying of the Messiah. The entire thing is controversial. That's the whole point. Well, it's not the point. The point is not to be controversial for the sake of being controversial, but the truth is controversial. So, with that said, we need to know that. We need to remember that before we are reading sayings like this, which don't go well with the modern crowd. Okay. So, first of all, in previous videos, I've mentioned how, in a previous video, I mentioned how, uh, how the saying before and after further supports the saying, um, the saying under question. However, I also tried to discuss, but perhaps didn't really clarify well, that not only is that the case, but for instance, the previous saying is further explained. All right, how do I? Okay, so the previous video I was talking about was go, uh, the Gospel of Thomas saying number 19. Uh, 19 was further enhanced by uh, 18 and 20, but not only this. 19 enhances 18 and it enhances 20. So the, the saying number 19 is enhanced, but it's also itself an enhancer. It enhances other sayings. With this saying 114, it's in, at the very end. Saying 114 only enhances one other saying. 
So that's what we're going to look at first. That is as follows. Saying 113 reads, His disciples said to him, When will the kingdom come? It will not come by waiting for it. It will not be a matter of saying here it is or there it is. Rather, the kingdom of the Father is spread out upon the earth and men do not see it. So, this refers to the idea that the kingdom of heaven is here already right now. It's all over the place. It's accessible to everyone. It's <coughs> but the people of this earth because they are blind to it, do not see it. Because they are blind, they do not see the kingdom of God. Um, and also we see that the theme of waiting, uh, it will not come by waiting. So the kingdom of God will not be introduced to us by waiting for it, but we have to do something to, to find it. What do we have to do to find the kingdom of heaven? Well, saying 112 enhances saying 113, which says, uh, Woe to... Yahushua said, Woe to the flesh that depends on the soul. Woe to the soul that depends on the flesh. Well, saying 113, uh, 112 doesn't necessarily tell us what we must do to enter the kingdom of God, but it tells us what we must not do to enter the kingdom of God. Just like in saying 113, it also tells us what we must not do. It says, it will not come by waiting for it, so don't wait for it because that's not going to help it come. That's not going to make it come. And it will not be a matter of saying, there it is, here it is, or there it is. So us... It's not going to be about uh, us saying, oh, look, now it's coming to us. Now we have it. Finally, it hasn't been here, but now it's coming to us. No, that's not the way it's going to be either. Also, uh, so basically, the, the, the body, the, the flesh that depends on the soul, um, will not bring the kingdom of God. And the soul that depends on the flesh will also not bring the kingdom of God to us. Now, what is flesh and what is soul? Soul refers to life in the scriptures. Soul is life. Life, in particular context here, refers to this life, the mortal life. So, woe to the flesh, to the man, the, the being, the mortal person, or this could apply to any of God's creatures, but... Woe to the mortal that depends on this life. That recalls another saying of the Messiah, which says, um, it says, he that has the whole world, but, um, I, I can't remember it exactly. Hold on, let me look it up. I can't believe I don't remember this word for word. Okay. Oh, word. Sorry about that. I, and you probably know which saying I'm talking about, so you probably don't even need me to look it up, but for my own sake, I want to look it up. Okay, so this is from Matthew chapter 14. It reads, For whoever, whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Uh, for what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Okay, so that idea right there, it refers to the fact that the, the, uh, this life here on earth is not the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is the next life the immortal soul. So woe to that flesh, woe to the mortal that depends on this life. And woe to uh, the, the life, woe to the 
again, is woe to the, the person of living, the creature of living, who depends on the flesh. This refers to the body. They're both talking about depending on this life rather than the next life. And the flesh is generally used to refer to the sins of the flesh, which are lust. So basically indulging in the pleasures of the flesh, contrary to what God has commanded. Not exercising self-control of the use of your body, but using it for various, uh, any number of sins. And there would be no limit. You would just use it for whatever. So this refers to depending on the flesh. And that will not get you to keep, see the kingdom of God. So if you want to see the kingdom of God, you must stop depending on the flesh. So you must stop sinning. And you must also not seek this world. You must not be dependent on this world. Um, and saying 114 says uh, that you must become a male. You must stop being a woman and you must become a man in order to be saved. So this refers, that's what you must do. Before, saying 112 and 113 says what you must not do. Saying 114 says what you must do. You must stop being a man and become a woman to, uh, excuse me, stop being a woman and become a man to be, to receive the kingdom of God. So now let's go and discuss what saying 114. I'm going to read it. Simon Peter said to him, Let Mary leave us, for women are not worthy of life. Yahushua said, I myself shall lead her in order to make her male, so that she too may become a living spirit, resembling you males, for every woman who will make herself male will enter the kingdom of heaven. Is that not controversial or what? Okay, so now, this is not saying what people think it means. Okay, it's not referring to the literal male and female. It's referring to allegorical male and female. What people don't understand is that male and female in ancient languages refers to a greater concept than just um, gender of a person. It also refers to gender of objects. How can an object have a gender? The idea is that uh, gender is much broader than we are making it. In the relationship between masculine and feminine, the masculine is the one that is the submitter, I mean, is the one who is the head, who is submitted to, is the strong one. And the woman is the weak one who, who the feminine complements the strong. The feminine is the helper, as it said in Genesis chapter one, uh, chapter three, no, wait, excuse me, chapter two. The woman was given to man as a helper, and she submits to the man, and the man is submitted to. That's the relationship here. In the book of Enoch, it says. The waters above fell down when it was the flood, came down on the waters below. It refers to the waters above as masculine and the waters below as feminine. Why? Because the waters below are have to submit to the force of the waters above. And then the waters mix together and become one. That is symbolic of the uh, man and woman in marriage becoming one. So right there, that refers to solely the, um, the superior and inferior, the submitted one, the, the person submitted to, and the, excuse me, the thing submitted to, and this submitting, the one that the thing that does the submitting. Um, so also now I'm going to read you some other sayings which support what I am saying here. So, I'm going to read my note. It says, uh, so, there perhaps is not a more controversial passage in the Gospel of Thomas. Just what exactly did the Messiah mean when he said this? Why are women not worthy of life? 
And why does Messiah agree with Peter, saying that he will change women into men so that they may be saved? The answer will be found in other ancient witnesses. The Church Father Clement of Alexandria said this in one of his writings, Stramata, Book 3, Chapter 9, Verse 63. But those who set themselves against God's creation because of continence, which has a fair-sounding name, quote also those words which were spoken to Salome, of which I made mention before. They are contained, I take it, in the Gospel according to the Egyptians. For they say that the Savior himself said, I came to destroy the works of a female. By female he means lust, by works, birth, and decay. Here Clement of Alexandria, the church father, attests to the historical meaning of female and male. Female was used as a reference to that which was the lower, lesser, inferior aspect of life, that being lust. Someone who lusts is a female, whereas someone who obeys Yahuwah in righteousness is a male. So the Messiah is clearly saying that in order to be saved, you must not commit the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, that you must expel the evil from within you and be obedient to him. Recently, I came upon an even more amazing witness to this saying, which preserves the original saying in its narrative context, probably from one of the lost sections of the Gospel, uh, one of the other Gospels of Scripture, such as Peter or Mary. The following is quoted in the ancient writing known as the Apostolic Church Order. Peter said, We have gone too fast in making ordinances. Let us signify accurately concerning the offering of the body and the blood. John said, You have forgotten, brethren, when the teacher asked for the bread in the cup and blessed them, saying, This is my body and my blood, that he permitted not these women to be with us. Martha said, Because of Mary, because he saw her smiling. Mary said, I did not verily laugh, but I remembered the words of our Lord, and was glad, for you know that he said unto us aforetime, when he taught us that that which is weak shall be saved by means of that which is strong. Um, so I'm going to finish the rest in my... Uh, description um, in of this video. The rest will be in the description. So thank you and Shalom. Shalom, this is Anayahu. In this video I am seeking to do a commentary on saying number four of the Gospel of Thomas. Now I just want to say this one quick thing that in the previous two sayings that I've been a commentary on of the Gospel of Thomas so far, I tried to do, to include not only the saying itself, but also the sayings that it enhanced. I am not going to do that for the, any of the other sayings, um, and I'm going to redo the ones that I enhanced in the previous videos, just because it's too confusing and it would be too many overlaps and too many repeats, so I don't want that. So I'm just going to do one per, per, one saying per video. In that, I will do how I will do it is say the one saying and then the two sayings that enhance that saying, rather than what I used to be doing was not only that, but I also did the two sayings that enhanced. The previous one and the two sayings that enhanced the one that came after. So I'm not going to do that. Just this one saying and the two sayings that enhance the one saying. I'm going to be just doing commentary on in each of these videos from now on. With that said, this is saying number four of the Gospel of Thomas. We read from saying number four. Yahushua said, the man old in days will not hesitate to ask a small child seven days old about the place of life, and he will live. For many who are first will become last, and they that become one, and they will become one and the same. Okay, so what does this saying mean? In particular, why the seven days? First of all, it mentions a man old in days. This represents someone near the end of his life. So the end 
Throughout the Gospel of Thomas, we see the end and the beginning being equated to each other and coupled together. So right here, the the man olden days, so the end, will not hesitate to ask a small child seven days old, so the end will not hesitate to ask the beginning about the place of life, and he will live. For many who are first will become last, and they will become one and the same. So who are the, who are the first? The first are the infants, and the infants will become last. They will become the old men. And they will become one and the same. The distinction between the beginning and the end is, according to the Gospel of Thomas, the beginning and the end are the same. So they will become one and the same. The beginning and the end will become one and the same. Um, elsewhere, however, the Messiah says, the one who must be first will be last, and the last will be first. But he uses this in a somewhat different sense. He basically uses it to suggest that uh, the person who wants to be first will be last in the kingdom of God, and the person who is last will be first in the kingdom of God, emphasizing that it is the apparent unworthiness of the things of that are last, which God approves of, rather than, he doesn't approve the things that humans say are worthy, because humans so often embrace vain things, which they view as um, first, being the first and the greatest. But in God's eyes, the greatest is actually the lowest in man's eyes. And so we have this distinction here. But in the Gospel of Thomas, the first and the last seem to be referring into... There might be some connections there between what Messiah said and the other Gospels. But um, for here, it specifically seems to be referring that the, the beginning and the end will become one and the same. And... Oh, you know what? Actually, I did find a connection here. Um, so the beginning, uh, excuse me, the first, those who want to be first will be last. So the first is becoming last and those who are last will become first. It's the first and last becoming last and first, or in other words, becoming one and the same. They're exchanging their, what they become. Um, now. Why seven days? Does seven days have any special significance? Yes, it does have special significance. Because when we learn in scripture, we learn for there are several things. I, I believe I believe of every saying doesn't necessarily have to have just one interpretation, but it can have multiple valid interpretations. So a couple interpre interpretations, um alternate interpretations, I have three interpretations. The two of them are very similar to each other, and the third one is much different, but I believe all three are valid, and probably all three are true. So what are the three? These three are, the first one is, the seven days refers to the creation week, okay? The child that is seven days old refers to the earth that is seven days old. The man olden days will not hesitate to ask ask a basically um, looking back to the earth, the young earth, to seek the answer to life. Because again, to find God, you have to go to the beginning. Because in the beginning, that's where the end is. That's the purpose of God is found straight from the very beginning. And that's the purest form of it. Right in the beginning you find it. So that right there is a connection to the seven days. Another one is the seven allegorical days, which where in scripture it equates one day as equaling a thousand years in the sight of God. So the church fathers and the scripture writers and Jewish rabbis all agreed that 
the seven days of creation were prophetic type, a prophetic type of the, the totality of the years of mortality. The 7,000 years where from the time of the fall of man to the time of the end of all things of this first age would be 7,000 years. 6,000 years fighting against the influence of Satan. And the final 1,000 years is a Sabbath from the influence of Satan because Satan will be bound for a thousand years during the millennial kingdom, according to the revelation of John. So that right there, that's the 7,000 years, the allegory, which is seven days. So the man olden days, well, I hesitate to ask a small child, seven days old, about the place of life. In other words, he will not hesitate to go to the the seven days of all creation, um, the seven days of all time of this first age, because that is where a place of life will be found in basically the reason why mortality exists in the first place, the whole reason for why things are the way they are right now. It's because of the next life. It's everything that exists right now is in preparation for the next life. And one more, which I believe is the most intended meaning and most prominent the one that messiah actually had in his mind when he was speaking this is according to scripture when when a child became circumcised that marked a new birth that marked a transition period between infancy to a acceptance in among the people of god they, they were accepted among the covenant of Abraham by becoming circumcised. Now it says in the law of Moses that the child was supposed to be circumcised on the, is supposed to be circumcised on the eighth day that of its, after it's born. So the reason it says seven days, the reason it says seven days Hold on a moment. Okay. So the reason it says seven days is because um because the that is the closest thing to the age of circumcision without being circumcised. So in other words, it's trying to make a point and saying, uh, it's saying that you need to go back to the beginning, even before circumcision, even before the child is circumcised. That's how close you have to be to the beginning. Because when you, only by going to the very beginning, that is where you find the end. So that shows that circumcision is a, a circumcised human male is too far from the beginning. You have to go farther back than that because that is not the pure beginning. The very pure beginning is that which has received nothing and is at its very, the very state it was born in, the seven days. That's the closest thing to, to circumcision. And that's why I mentioned seven days as connecting it to circumcision, trying to make that point. Um, now, the two sayings surround it and are there to enhance it. Um, the one after saying number five, it says, Yahushua said, recognize what is in your sight and that which is hidden from you will become plain to you for there is nothing hidden which will not become manifest. So, recognize what is in your sight. Um, the, what is hidden is the, um, the place of life. As we, that is what the connection is, the enhancement. And so, 
it's telling us to recognize what is in your sight because the place of life is in our sight. Um, it will become plain to us and as it says, for there is nothing hidden which will not become mani become manifest. And again, the Messiah said that they will become one and the same. So eventually it will be identified according to Messiah. But this is telling us that we need to seek the seven-year-old child and ask it about the place of life now rather than later. Because no matter what, we are going to find out about the place of life, but we need to seek it now if we want to enter into the place of life. In the previous saying, saying three reads, Yahushua said, If those who lead you say, See, the kingdom is in the sky, then the birds of the sky will precede you. If they say to you, It is in the sea, then the fish will precede you. Rather, the kingdom is inside of you, and it is outside of you. When you come to know yourselves, then you will become known, and you will realize that it is you who are the sons of the living Father. But if you will not know yourselves, you dwell in poverty, and it is you who are that poverty. Again, so basically, uh, the man, to find out who the man truly is, he has to go back to the beginning, because he used to be an infant of seven days. So the man is still the same person as the child of seven days. And that child represents the, the child is, the or comes from the father, the originates from the father. So sons of the living father, that is who we are. That is the place of life is the father. And so that is the, that is the answer. We ask the child seven year, days old about the place of life. And the place of life is the father, because that's the origination of the child of seven days old. And that that is the connection right there. Anyways, the I'm about to be at 15 minute mark, so thank you for watching this video, and shalom. Shalom, this is Annie Yahoo. In this video, I am going to be doing a commentary on two sayings of the Gospel of Thomas, because they both are so connected to each other that I just need to do it in one video. One video series, that is. So, um, with that said, I am going to be doing a commentary on saying number 13 and saying number 14. Saying 13 reads, Yahushua said to his disciples, Compare me to someone and tell me whom I am like. Simon Peter said to him, You are like a righteous angel. Matthew said to him, You are like a wise philosopher. Thomas said to him, Master, my mouth is wholly incapable of saying whom you are like. Yahushua said, <coughs> I am not your master. Because you have drunk, you have become intoxicated by the bubbling spring which I have measured out. Yeah, let me read that again. I am not your master because you have drunk. Uh, you have become intoxicated by the bubbling spring which I have measured out. And he took him and withdrew and told him three things. When Thomas returned to his companions, they asked him, What did Yahushua say to you? Thomas said to them, If I tell you one of the things which he told me, you will pick up stones and throw them at me. A fire will come out of the stones and burn you up. Okay. So, what exactly do we have here? Well, this saying is similar to what we have in the Gospel of Matthew, where he, the Messiah asks, it says, um, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Son Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus, Yahushua answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, 
for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and where whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Okay, so that is similar to it because in both accounts he asks his disciples a very similar question. He says in Gospel of Thomas, compare me to someone and tell me whom I, whom I am like. And the others, and in, in Matthew he asks, who am I like, who, who do they say I am? In other words, who am I like in other people's eyes? What do they think I am? This very connected very similar sayings here. In the Gospel of Thomas, Thomas is the one who is um, who is praised for his insight from the Father. In Matthew, it's Peter who's praised for his insight from the Father. These are ever it's not a contradiction, however, because they're two separate events, two separate narratives. And both are intended to teach us a truth of of God. So, so what we have here is, um, so according to Son Peter, Messiah is like a righteous angel. Now, while Peter is correct that the Messiah shares some aspects of a righteous angel, being that he formerly lived the life of an angel, However, he is more than an angel, and it can't just can't be compared to an angel, because he's just so much more. So then, Matthew said, you are like a wise philosopher. Matthew, in one sense, is correct. Like the wise philosophers who have the, who have a handle on the truth, who are very wise and well-beloved of people, Messiah also is very wise. He is among the top of intelligences. However, this too, this analysis of the Messiah fails because there is just simply no comparison. The wisest of philosophers are idiots in the sight of God. God himself, who is the Messiah, is so much more than the wisest philosopher. So then, but Thomas, Thomas here gets it right. Thomas says, Master, my mouth is wholly incapable of saying whom you are like. In other words, you aren't like anything that we can conceive of. So your question is a trick question because there is nothing. We can't compare you to anything, to who you are like, because you are above everything that exists. You are the greatest of all. This is Thomas's words. So Thomas, you know, he's very bold in what he says. The Messiah, the others expect the Messiah to not really approve of this saying, of this response of Thomas, but Messiah um, surprises them and basically endorses what Thomas said. He says, now this is also controversial. He said, because you have drunk from the, the bubbling spring which I measured out for you. You, I am no longer your master. This is a controversial statement. I am not your master. So controversial that when you read it to certain Christians, they will automatically say this is not scripture because of that. I was talking to my dad. He was going. He was reading through the Gospel of Thomas while I, while I was away, and when he and then he asked me. He said, "Do you accept the Gospel of Thomas as scripture?" And I said, "Yes, I do." And he said, "I can't believe you accept this book as scripture. How can you accept it when there's so wacky and you know, teachings in it like this one?" And then he pointed to this particular saying and read it to me, and talks about how. He finds the phrase being drunk a strange, um, strange way to word it, and also 
the main thing he didn't like was that it said you I that it said that the Messiah was no longer the master of Thomas. However, in Hebrew, being drunk, it, the, the word in Hebrew is not drunk, it's being filled. Being filled with something, not drunk. As in our day and age, drunk meaning uh, basically intoxicated. That's not what the actual Hebrew meant. Um, and another thing, I'm going to read from you the Gospel of John. This says as follows. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. So did you see that right there? According to the Gospel of John, No longer do I call you servants. That's an exact parallel to no longer am I your master. If we're no longer his servants, then he's no longer our master. You can't have one without the other. A master can only be a master if the servants are the servants of the master. But here he says, you are no longer my servants. And why? Because now you're my friends. I call you my friends. Because a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have revealed all these things to you, and you are my friends, therefore. So this is not saying that Thomas shouldn't follow God, serve him, but that he is not, because of his answer, that kind of answer, if he, that will allow him, believing that and following that and living that in his life, will allow him to be the friend of God. Just like Abraham was a friend of God. Um, so because of this, because of Thomas's insight, the Messiah decided to reveal three things to Thomas. Now these three things aren't mentioned in this particular saying. However, the very next saying reveals those three things. But so apparently the three things were so controversial that uh, they would show him. Hold on. Okay, sorry about that. Um, that lost me a lot of time. Okay, so I'm going to probably have to do a, a second part of this. Um, so, okay, where are we now? Um, so I'm going to get to the three sayings in a moment. But now let's discuss the, uh, the saying number 12 enhances saying 13. So that is, it reads, The disciples said to Yehushua, We know that you will depart from us. Who is to be our leader? Yehushua said to them, Wherever you are, you are to go to... Now this is different because in most translations it says James the Righteous, or James the Just. But truly, the actual original said Jacob the Righteous for whose sake heaven and earth came to be. Jacob is a reference to Israel. Okay, So, you were to go to Israel, the righteous, for whose sake heaven and earth came into being. Heaven and earth did not come into being for James the Apostle. It came for Israel, the people chosen of God, the covenant people. So, the people who are saved, the elect ones, 
as scripture refers to um, Israel as the people of God. Spiritual Israel, all those who are part of Israel spiritually are the people of God. They are synonymous with them. So this enhances what we just read in that um, the, the idea here is in order to be part of Israel, we have to be like Thomas. We have to accept the Messiah as he actually is and not as what uh, false teachers claim portray him as. We have to accept him as fully God. He is the Father himself, Yahuwah. We have to accept him for who he is. Okay? So, and, so Israel is the leader of all people. And Messiah also, in one sense, is Israel. So we must flock to Israel. We must go to him, for he is our leader. And he is the representative of Israel. He is the king of Israel. He is the priest of Israel. And all nations must submit to his kingship and priesthood. And therefore they must submit to Israel, because he is of Israel. And therefore Israel, through him, rules over all the nations. Um, I want to stop here, and I'm going to continue this commentary in part two. Thank you, and shalom. Shalom, this is Danny Yahoo. This is part two in my commentary on the Gospel of Thomas, saying number 13 and 14. So I had just read saying 12, which uh, referred to Jacob, the righteous. And I and used it to enhance saying number 13. Um, it also, that saying also reveals to us why heaven and earth came into being. It came into being for the sake of the righteous, for the sake of righteousness. Um, and for, for Messiah's sake, for, um, and so let's see here. Also, there's a connection. It says you will become intoxicated or drunk. Um, one moment. Let's go upstairs. Come on. Yeah. Alright. So, sorry about that. Um, so, the connection here is the bubbling spring. The Messiah measured out the bu bubbling spring so that we could become filled with it. Filled with it, the life water. In the same way, he created the heavens and the earth so that we could uh, for, be saved, so that we could enter into life. That is why, for the sake of righteousness, for the sake of Israel, the full elect of Israel, the heavens and the earth came into being. And also, they said, we know that you will depart from us. So they understand that the Messiah's mission specifically makes it so that he has to leave. Why does he have to leave? Because of who he is. Who he is is why he has to leave. And who he is is in verse, I mean, is in saying number 13, where he describes who he is. And Thomas says that you are above all things. And because he's above all things, that is why he has to depart. Now, saying number 14. Remember in saying 13, we discussed that there were three very controversial things that Messiah told Thomas. These three things were so controversial that Thomas was convinced that if he told them that with 
if there weren't any laws or anything like that, the apostles who heard what Thomas had to say would be so enraged that they would try to stone him. We see throughout the Gospels that it was not lawful for them to stone because they were under the Roman authority of the government. The Roman authority had jurisdiction over Israel. So they did not have the right to administer their own death penalty without the permission of the Romans. And yet, some of the Jews were very uh, angry, and some of them tried to take the law into their own hands and stone the Messiah without a trial. So we see right there that that is not good. And that is contrary to the law of Moses, contrary to scripture. You have to go through the law, submit to the governing authority that righteously is our authority. Um, so, now, um, I'll continue. Um, so yeah, and he says, if you, if you, you would throw, try to stone me, however, fire would come out of those stones and burn you up. That right there shows that God will protect me for these teachings because God supports what I'm saying. He just told me, so he would support me for these teachings. Um, and again, that's connected to the idea of the stones ministering for the people. Um, so what are the three sayings? Well, the very next saying, saying 14, tells us what these three sayings are. They, and I'll read saying 14. Yahushua said to them, If you fast, you will give rise to sin for yourselves. And if you pray, you will be condemned. And if you give alms, you will do harm to your spirits. When you go into any land and walk about in the distance, uh, in it, Walk about in the districts. If they receive you, eat what they will set before you, and heal the sick among you. For what goes into your mouth will not defile you, but that which issues from your mouth, it is that which will defile you. So what are the three teachings? The three teachings that are controversial are, uh, it's a sin to, to pray, sin to fast, and sin to give alms. Wait a minute. Doesn't this contradict scripture? What is this? What is Messiah saying here? It doesn't make sense. I simply don't understand. Well, I'll tell you. I'll tell you the one who doesn't understand. This is what he. This is what he meant. When we read the scriptures, we see similar sayings to this. Saying, I mean, not saying. Matthew chapter six. In the Sermon on the Mount, reads as follows. It says, Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men, to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a chari charitable deed, do not sound trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, they, that they may have glory from them. Assuredly, I say to you, they have the reward. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in secret, and your father who sees in secret will himself reward you. And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues, and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut the, your door, pray to your father who is in the secret place, and your father who sees you in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathens do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore do not be like them. Um, and in another place, and I think in the Epistle of Barnabas, it says, or maybe in Didache, maybe in both, it says, do not come to your prayer with a sinful conscience. Okay, so right there it's saying, do not pray with a sinful, sinful conscience. Pray only with a righteous conscience. And fasting, it says in 
Matthew chapter 16, verse 14. Moreover, when you fast, do not be like hypocrites with a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear to men to be fasting. Surely, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, so that you do not appear to men to be fasting. But to your Father who is in the secret place, your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Okay. So right there, we see that that is similar. It has the three the three things right in the same place. Almsgiving, uh, prayer, and fasting. And what's it saying? Do not, do not give alms hypocritically. Do not pray hypocritically. Do not fast hypocritically. So, the sign here, those three teachings are controversial, but the point is that giving to charity, fasting, and prayer mean absolutely nothing unless you have a righteous heart in it. It's not part of our moral obligations to have all these countless fasts and prayers and these almsgivings. There's a certain minimum requirement that we are required to do. Sometimes we're required to fast, sometimes required to pray, and sometimes we're required to give alms. But for the times that we're not required to give those things, then it's not righteous if we do them with a wicked heart. In fact, it's a sin. It's a sin if we do any of those things with a wicked heart, even if we have an obligation to do them. Someone who prays hypocritically is, sin is sinning because he's praying. His prayer is sinful. When you fast sinfully, the fast itself is sinful. And when you give alms sinfully, that itself is sinful. So, in order for almsgiving, fasting, and prayer to be valuable, it has to be without sin. Okay, that's what the Messiah is teaching. Now, that's a very controversial thing, because they liked to gain approval because of their fasting, prayer, and their almsgiving. The Pharisees like to do that, because for them, the more you fasted, the more you prayed, and the more you gave alms, meant you were more righteous, no matter what else. As long as you did those things, you were in high standing with God. Um, but not according to the Messiah. The Messiah says it's much more than fasting, prayer, and almsgiving. And in fact, if you do those things with a wicked heart, you sin. In the Gospel of Matthew, we read that um, in Matthew chapter 15, the Messiah criticizes the, the, um, the Pharisees who, uh, who were criticizing the Messiah and his disciples for eating with unwashed hands. Now, this is not referring to health. It's referring to uh, traditions of men. The traditions of men were that uh, they required people to wash their hands. Even though the, the Torah, Law of Moses, does not say they had to wash their hands before every meal. So this was an addition by the Pharisees. But So Messiah is saying, all your extra traditions of men are valueless to me because they are filled with a wicked heart. Only a righteous heart makes you righteous. So all these extra commandments you are giving are not based on the heart, but they're based on flesh justification. Now, it's not the flesh that justifies us, it's the heart that controls the flesh, which justifies you, because the difference between sin and not sin is not founded in something physical, but it's founded in your mind. What's the difference between having sex with a, your wife and having sex with someone else's wife? The difference is in the mind, not in the body. Because what's what different? What's the difference between you having, uh, physically speaking, with you having sex with your wife and someone else's wife? Nothing's different. The same thing's happening. The same physical mechanisms that lead to an orgasm. That is what is happening. A man and a woman coming together. That is what is happening. Same thing when you're killing something. If you murder someone versus as if you defend yourself and kill someone 
through self-defense. Like, both things are the same physically, the person's dot dead. The same force might be used, the same timing, everything might be the same. But what makes it sinful is the mind, which indicates, okay, this person was trying to kill me, therefore self-defense. The mind indicates if it's self-defense, and the mind indicates if it's murder. The body doesn't indicate these things, but the mind, solely. So, um, and of course, and the Messiah mentions in both Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Thomas that um, it's yeah, it's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth that defiles a man, and these things that come out of the mouth are all these various sins, okay? Um, and so, and he also mentions when you go into any land and walk about in the districts, if they receive you, eat what they set before you and heal the sick among them. That is a that same as the Gospel of Luke, right there, and the Gospel of Luke, uh, and Gospel of Thomas say that um, eat whatever they said before you. Do not use all these extra commandments that um, changes what God's law is. Rather, it's supposed to be from the heart. So if they receive you, then be received by them, and don't add these extra commandments that. Uh, split you guys away. Thank you and Shalom. Shalom, this is Annie Yahoo. In this video, I seek to discuss three specific sayings of the Gospel of Thomas uh, and do a commentary on them. These three sayings are saying seven, saying eight, and saying nine. The reason I pick these three uh, be is because that they are, they share a very uh, very important theme, and this theme is that of animals. The animals feature prominently in the point Messiah is trying to make. So with that said, allow us to read the very middle one. Saying number eight, it reads, and he said, the kingdom is like a wise fisherman who cast his net into the sea and drew it up from the sea full of small fish. Among them, the wise fisherman found a fine large fish. He threw all the small fish back into the sea and chose the large fish without difficulty. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. This saying is also found in the Gospel of Matthew. Now, what is the significance of this saying? This refers to the kingdom of God, as it said in the beginning. As it said, the kingdom is like a wise fisherman. Who found the fish but so the kingdom is the large fish okay the large fish is among the small fish what do the small fish represent it represents all the other choices you can make all the other possibilities all different other religions all the different philosophies that are contrary to the truth but the large fish is the kingdom of God that is the one true religion, the one path to righteousness, to salvation. So, according to this saying, as other sayings of Gospel of Thomas and the other Gospels of Scripture show, is that the kingdom of heaven is not far away, it's not distant. It's in our midst. We can have we have access to it. It's not something far away. As in the book of Deuteronomy says. It is not over the over the uh, sea so that you have to ask someone to go get it for you. It's not in heaven so you have to ask someone to retrieve it for you. Rather, it is right in your heart. That's what the book of Deuteronomy says. I paraphrased a little bit, but it says that in, uh, I think, Deuteronomy chapter 30. Um, the law of Moses is not too difficult, according to that chapter. But it is in your heart. It is within the, your power to achieve it. You don't have to 
to grasp it somewhere else. It's You don't have to ask someone to help you. It's right there within your midst, your power to achieve it. So, so notice that this man who received this, this fish must be extremely huge because he has to, in order to keep this big fish, he has to throw away all the small fish. So what does he do? He chooses the big fish and throws away all that small fish. That teaches us that in order to receive the kingdom of God, to enter it, you, we can't have all these fishes in our life. We can't have all these sins, all these philosophies that are contrary to the truth. We can only have the one pure, true righteousness, which is the religion of the Messiah. The life of the Messiah in righteousness that has to be within our heart. And we have to be perfectly righteous. Otherwise, we will not be saved. We will not enter the kingdom of God. So, that right there. We must get rid of all that extra stuff. And then, of course, most people who catch a fish usually eat the fish. Okay? So, eventually, we take the fish into our body, and the fish becomes part of us. So, the, the kingdom of God, we eat it, we accept it, and it becomes part of who we are. It becomes our very essence, our soul. So, that, that's the first thing right there. Then I will read um, the next thing after that. Yehoshua said, Now the sower went out, took a handful, and scattered them. Some fell on the road. The birds came and gathered them up. Gathered them up. Others fell on the rock, did not take root in the soil, and did not produce ears. And others fell on thorns. They choked the seed, and worms ate them. And others fell on the grounds, uh, fell on the good soil, and produced good fruit. It bore sixty per measure and a hundred and twenty per measure. That right there is also found in the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So this saying is canonical. Now. Um, so right there, that reference to some animals, reference to the birds and the worms. The birds and the worms eat the bad seed. So, basically, what is this refer reference here? The things of wilderness, we will be attacked and destroyed by, by the, the things that are contrary to our well-being contrary to our flourishing and growth. We will basically be cut off. Our lives will be cut short because we will be devoured by the, the enemy. And the enemy rightfully devours us because we are sinful, if we are, that is. So how do you uh, enter the kingdom of God? You must be like the very last seed, the very last kind of seed, which is on good soil and it produces good fruit. That right there is how you, how you become, uh, you have to choose the pure seed, okay? There's many seeds, but there's only one kind of seed that will prosper, and this is a seed that is valuable. This is a seed that produces fruit. And then we eat the fruit. So right there, another connection to eating. In order to eat of the good things, it must come from something good. And, of course, the, the eating again represents acceptance. Um, now, saying ten enhances saying nine. And saying ten reads, Yahushua said, I have cast fire upon the world, and see, I am guarding it until it blazes. This represents the this refers to the idea of guarding something, keeping it safe until it meets its purpose. Uh, that is what we also have to do when we're planning a, a planning a farm farming. So the idea is the seed has to be protected 
it has to be uh, guarded until it flourishes, until it expands and becomes what it was, what it was planned to be by the, be, by the initiator of the process. So that right there, that's the enhancement we have. And of course, I already referred to how these two sayings, uh, saying eight and nine enhance each other because they both refer to the, uh, the, the large fish and the, 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 the soul seed that we have to, that we have to accept. And so now the next saying is saying seven and it reads, Yahushua said, Blessed is the lion, which becomes man, uh, when consumed by man. And cursed is the man whom the lion consumes, and the lion becomes man. So, in this way, there's two ways that the lion becomes man. In the first way, the lion becomes a man when it's consumed by man. That refers to the general idea of you are what you eat. So when someone eats something else, it becomes them. Now, first of all, we must understand that it is a sin for man to eat lion meat. However, in this sense, the Messiah is not endorsing a sinful practice, but what he is saying is that in the perspective of lion, the lion's energy is being transferred to a being that is greater than itself because humans were created to be the image of god the image of god refers to the kingship of humans over the rest of creation not does not refer to them having morality that's not what makes them the image of god what makes humans the image of god is that they're a king over the rest of creation so they're superior to the rest of creation. So when the lion becomes a human through that energy process of transference, while it is a sinful and a disrespect to the lion, at the same time, blessed is the lion because he has become superior to what he formerly was. But cursed is the man whom the lion consumes and the lion becomes man so that right there the lion consumes a man and then the lion becomes man what does this refer to it refers to the aspect of humanity where they are the predators they are the again once again they are the head authority the king over creation so when the lion kills a human he is exercising his authority over the human so and in, in that example he becomes like a human where he he is superior over the human and because he killed him so now what what is the lion in both these cases the lion is the sinner is sinfulness in the first instance the lion becomes a man now in the shepherd of hermes a man is a reference to an angel so in this case, I believe a man references righteousness. So a man becomes right, uh, a, a sinful person, sinful creature becomes righteous. That, per, that one is blessed. But if a sinful one devours a righteous one, then that, um, that uh, that sinner, it, that's not a good thing. That curse is that, because the sinner sinned again, and in is man in a different sense, in a wicked sense. The lion is man in a bad sense. So that right there shows us some very amazing connections. All these three talk about the animals and. So saying six enhances the lion by 
It says, His disciples questioned him and said to him, Do you want us to fast? How shall we pray? Shall we give alms? What diet shall we observe? Yahushua said, Do not tell lies and do not do what you hate, for all things are plain in the sight of heaven. For nothing hidden will not become manifest, and nothing covered will remain without being uncovered. This refers to that all things will be will be made known. This and the lion will be subjected to the superior, and it will have to be judged. Um, and let's see here. And so, how does the lion become a man in the good sense? He fulfills righteousness. He stops sinning. He does not tell lies and does not do what he hates. Um, plain in the sight of heaven. So that's the connection right there. And the video is almost o over, almost at the 15 minute mark. But I do remember reading in one version of the Gospel of Thomas that I have, one translation, that it, that it references in um, saying eight, apparently saying eight reads um, reads that uh, the it talks about a true human saying eight I'll read it and this version says a true human being can be compared to a wise fisherman and in the, this other translation Yahushua said a human being can be compared to a wise fisherman so this book, you know, the lion and this saying refer to what a true human being is, and that is a righteous one. Uh, anyways, thank you and shalom. Shalom, this is Annie Yahoo. Uh, in this video, I seek to do a commentary on three sayings of the Gospel of Thomas. Saying number 24, saying 25, and saying 26. That said, allow me to begin. The first saying I'd like to read is saying 25. Yahushua said, love your brother like your soul, guard him like the pupil of your eye. A nice and short saying refers, the essence of it is love your brother. That sounds similar, yeah, basically love your, um, love him as yourself, as if he was yourself. And that is found in the Gospels um, in a different form, but the same, the same moral message and philosophical message is portrayed to us in the Gospels as in the Gospel of Thomas and guard him like the pupil of your eye. Now this is significant because it refers to the eye. Now notice the previous saying and the following saying connect to the eye. The previous saying reads his disciples said to him, Show us the place where you are, since it is necessary for us to seek it. He said to them, Whoever has ears, let him hear. There is light within a man of light, and he lights up the whole world. If he does not shine, he is darkness. The, the eye is connected to light. The light in the eye. So, um... And also, whoever has ears, let him hear, which is, connects to whoever has eyes, let him see. And the light within a man of light lights up the whole world. Um, and this is connected to the love. The love is the light of the man. And guard him like the pupil of your eye. The connection here is... Your brother, you are to guard like light. Your he the your brother is to be your light. Protect protect the light. Um, if you don't protect the light, then your and if you don't support the light, then your eye will be in darkness. Um, and so also. In the following saying, saying 26, it says, Yahushua said, You see the, the moat in your brother's eye, but you do not see the beam in your own eye. 
When you cast the beam out of your own eye, then you will see clearly to cast the mote from your brother's eye. So right here, connecting again to the eye, first to the one who has something obstructing their vision, something is in their eye, um, in order to receive the righteousness, you must remove it from your eye. You must remove the things from your eye. That is how you could truly love your brother like your soul and guard him like the pupil of your eye. This refers to uh, taking care of your brother. Just in this saying, you see the moat in your brother's eye, but you do not see the beam in your own eye. First, you have to cast out the beam out of your own eye. Then you can see clearly to cast the moat out from your brother's eye. So this refers to you know, the love and concern for the brother. So we had the one saying, it says, love your brother like your soul. Guard him like the pupil of your eye. Um, what this saying is, you need, you cannot guard your brother if you do not guard your own self. And you cannot guard your brother's eye if you do not guard your own eye. So guard him as if you were guarding your own pupil. That's the connection here. Um, so this refers to seeing in love. And in order to love your brother, you must first be able to see, and you then must help him to see the light of God. Um, so now, saying 24 you know, is enhanced by the love of the soul pupil of the eye, tells us what the light is. The light is love. Um, but also, then, saying 20, 23 enhances 24. It says, Yahushua said, I shall choose you one out of a thousand and two out of ten thousand, and they shall stand as a single one. Okay, so, that right there, um, it shows the connection of the, first of all, the standing out. So, in the Gospel of John, it refers to the light, how the light pierces the darkness, and you know, it's very peculiar, very striking, and you can notice it. It's very distinct and separate. In the same way, he will choose um, the person out of a thousand and two out of ten thousand. They shall stand as a single one. So, and where shall they stand? They shall stand uh, where the Messiah is, because the, the, his disciples asked him, show us the place where you are, since it is necessary for us to seek it. And Messiah says that he is where the light is, the light and the man of light. He is where the man of light is as well. Um, and remember, the love your brother enhances this concept of light. And so... The single one, the standing as a single one, refers to the, the people coming out of the multitude of hatred and darkness into the light of love. And they will stand together as ones who love others. And um, let's see here. The, um, Okay, and saying 26, the moat in your eye one, is enhanced by saying 27. It says, if you do not... Wait, hold on. Let me just read the, quickly the Greek. Okay. All right. Um, so, if you do not fast as regards the world, you will not find the kingdom. If you do not observe the Sabbath, as a Sabbath, you will not see the Father. So... Right there. What is fasting from the world? The world is darkness, okay? And the world is the, the blindness 
of the eye. To fast from the hypocrisy of the world, you are to stop being hypocritical and remove the moat from your eye so that you can give practice your love. If you do not do this, you will not see the kingdom. And also it connects it to the Sabbath. The Sabbath is ceasing from your own activities to do the activities of God. Ceasing to be self-centered and being centered on God. So, if you do not keep the Sabbath as commanded, you will not be saved. In the literal sense, this is true. The Sabbath is an eternal ordinance, but also in a more spiritual understanding, it is also true that we must fast from the world, and we must also cease from the activities of the world. We must cease from their way of living and focus on God and not ourselves and not our own activities. We should focus on the love of God. This is the Sabbath. The Sabbath is loving God and loving your neighbor rather than loving yourself. That is what true Sabbath keeping is all about. Um, and so, now why do we keep the Sabbath? We keep the Sabbath to see the Father. The Sabbath allows us to uh, come to Him and to be in His presence. This is a significant thing. This is why we keep the Sabbath, because of the sanctity of it. The Father sanctified the Sabbath. So because he sanctified it, in order to be accepted by the Father, we have to respect what his sanctity is. And his sanctity is the Sabbath, along with other things. But one of the most important ones of sanctity is the Sabbath. And that is not only how we love our brother, but how we love God. We love the Father like the pupil of our own eye by keeping his Sabbath by ceasing from our way of living and obeying his way of living and doing things as he commands of us, as he expects and requires of us. That is how we see the Father. And the following saying enhances saying 27. It says, Yahushua said, I took my place in the midst of the world and I appeared to them in the flesh. I found all of them intoxicated. I found none of them thirsty, and my soul became afflicted for the sons of men, because they are blind in their hearts and do not have sight. For empty they came into the world, and empty too they seek to leave the world. But for a moment they are intoxicated. When they shake off their wine, then they will repent. So that right there refers to, once again, fasting from the things of this world. The wine, you fast from the wine of this world and cease from the activities of it, um, the world is intoxicated in sin. None of them were thirsty for the Sabbath of God. None of them were thirsty for seeing Him and living righteously. Um, and they again, it connects it to the sight. All of these, these sayings are so interconnected. It's amazing. Um, the it, it equates not keeping the Sabbath with being blind and not having sight and being empty. In order to be full of the Father's love, we have to obey Him in all things. We have to... Um, and then again, it says, Empty too, they seek to leave the world. In the previous saying, it says, If you do not, if you do not fast as regards the world, so, in this saying 28, the person is empty in the sense that they have the world. But in saying 27, it says, you need to be empty in regards to the world in order to enter the kingdom. Um, so, they seek to enter the kingdom by clinging to their emptiness of the world, but... The true way to enter the kingdom is to 
be empty of this world. To not be full of the emptiness of this world, but to be empty of the fullness of this world. Okay? Um, so that's pretty much all I have to say about this. Um, that was a... I said I was only going to do three sayings, but I was able to fit in the fourth saying of the Sabbath. And I do believe strongly that the Messiah intentionally was referring to both a spiritual Sabbath and the actual physical, literal Sabbath. We're supposed to keep the Sabbath as a Sabbath in all senses of this word. We're supposed to cease dis dispatching on the Sabbath. We're supposed to cease doing our own things and focus on the things of God. For keeping the Sabbath is the true obedience of God. Uh, in the law of Moses, essentially, if we break any, if we sin on the Sabbath, we deserve the death penalty because sinning on the Sabbath is Sabbath breaking. So if we're caught sinning on the Sabbath, that is punishable by death. Um, so the Sabbath is a very serious issue and critical to understanding the truth. And Messiah often had controversies on the Sabbath, and it was all about how to love people. They were creating all these extra commandments about what we could and could not do on the Sabbath. And while extra commandments are not wrong if they're justified, and actually they're morally obliga obligatory if they are justified, however, making commandments that are contrary to love, such righteousness, are, is wrong. And therefore, Messiah seeks to show us what true love is, and true love is keeping the Sabbath correctly. Anyways, thank you, and Shalom. Shalom, this is Annie Yahoo. Uh, this video is a commentary on the first two sayings of the Gospel of Thomas, saying one and two. The reason I am doing these, final, these first two is because... Well, first of all, I feel led to, but secondly, I want to take a break a little bit from doing commentary on the Gospel of Thomas, just because it's difficult to do it all at once. So, but, I mean, I hope to do this commentary on the Gospel of Thomas um, in, by the end of this month to complete every one of the sayings. But um, in particular today, after these two sayings, I will have done... 10% of the entire Gospel of Thomas. And so, to sort of give my mind a little bit of a, a rest and a refresher, I am decided to do only these first two sayings right now so that I can uh, make it an even 14. Even 14 sayings out of... Wait, I'm sorry. Wait a minute. I did this math wrong. Um, I think, yeah. Okay, I did the math wrong. Uh, sorry about that, I don't know what I was thinking, but, um, at any rate, I'm still going to do it to 14, just because now, after that, I will have 100 sayings left over, rather than 114. So an even 100, it just looks nicer, and doesn't feel as overwhelming. Um, so with that said, I'm going to read the first two sayings and do commentary on them. The first saying is... Well, first of all, he introduces, Thomas introduces it and says, These are the secret sayings which the living Yahushua spoke and which Didymus Judas Thomas wrote down. This refers to his twin nature, as all those indicate different aspects of his twin, twinness. Um, so these are the secret sayings. Uh, so it says, And he said, Whoever finds the interpretation of these sayings will not experience death. Uh, this is also similar to Gospel of John, which reads in chapter 8, verses, uh, verse 51, it says, Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will, not see, he will never see death. So that right there. His words, his sayings. Um, he who... He who keeps his word, he who uh, finds his word, the interpretation of the sayings, guarding it, that's the equivalent of finding it, um, 
will not experience death. This shows that this secret, this emphasis on secret, it, his teachings having a secret nature, is not some kind of Gnostic strange teaching, because the Gospel of John emphasizes the secrecy of the Messiah himself. And not only this, but the other Gospels as well. When the demons try to proclaim him to be the Son of God, he, for, he rebukes them for doing this, because he doesn't want everyone to know yet. Similarly, he tells his disciples and some of the people he heals not to tell anyone that he's the Christ yet. Why? Because if he were to tell people he was the Christ, then that might get in the way of what his purpose was, and that is to save everyone as much as possible. Now, it is evident by analyzing the scriptures that most of the people were interested in the Messiah only for his miracles and not for righteousness sake. So, why did the Messiah say not to tell anybody? For the very reason that he didn't want people to come to him for the wrong reasons. That's why. He wanted it to be a pure and innocent faith, not a faith that was um, made impure by unrighteous uh, motivations and desires. So now we will read saying number two. Uh, Yahushua said, let him who seeks continue seeking until he finds. When he finds, he will become troubled. When he becomes troubled, he will be astonished, He and he will rule over the all. Okay, so, ruling over the all. Um, hold on, one moment. Okay, so, so that right there connects to this first saying. For the first saying was, whoever finds the interpretation of the sayings of the Gospel of Thomas will not experience death. The saying number two adds, let him who seeks continue seeking until he finds. So the person who's seeking for the interpretation of these sayings, let him seek and continue to seek until he finds the true interpretation. However, it gives us a warning. It says, when he finds the true interpretation, he will become troubled. Why will he become troubled? Because he'll, he'll realize how horrible and off the world is, how unrighteous it is. And when he becomes troubled, he will be astonished. Also, once again, astonished at how, how off things are. But also, and he will rule over the all. This ultimately refers to his destiny, that if he, if the person who seeks the truth finds it and keeps it and obeys it, then he will rule over all. He will inherit the earth, as the scriptures say, and that will be receiving the inheritance of righteousness, which is the kingdom of God, which is ruling over the all. Um, so those interplay right there, those connect to each other, and, um, you know, I might do another, I might do another saying in here. Okay, so, alright, um, yeah, I'm going to do another thing. Uh, but, so that, now let's read, uh, saying three. If those who lead you say, see the kingdom is in the sky, then the birds of the sky will precede you. If they say to you, it is in the sea, then the fish will precede you. Rather, the kingdom is inside of you, and it is outside of you. When you come to know yourself, then you will become known, and you will realize that it is you who are the sons of the living Father. But if you will not know yourselves, you dwell in poverty, and it is you who are that poverty. This refers, once again, to the idea of seeking the true interpretation. Um, so he says, the true interpretation here is connected to the kingdom of God. That is the true interpretation. You will not see death. You will enter the kingdom. So, um, but if those who say to you the kingdom is in the sky, or if it's in the sea, don't listen to them, because that's not where it is. So he's telling us that it's to find it, it's not in all these strange places. 
To find the kingdom of God, to find the true interpretation, we must go within ourselves and seek the answer within our hearts, because that is the only way we can come upon the truth, is if we derive it from ourselves, because it is in us. The kingdom of God is in us, so we must find it in ourselves. Um, and so when you come to know yourselves, then you will become known, and you will realize that you are the sons of the living Father. Um, so how do you come... Like, let me see. One, one, one. Um, so... So in the previous saying it said, when he finds, he will become troubled. So when you come to know yourself, you will first become troubled and then astonished, but then you will end up reigning over the all. Um, and the reigning over the all is equivalent to acknowledging yourself as the son of the living father. And however, it warns us and says, if you will not know yourselves, you dwell in poverty and it is you who are that poverty. So there tells us, if we do not find the true interpretation of these sayings, then we will be in poverty and we will not enter the kingdom. We will dwell in poverty forever and in lowness. We will experience death. Um, and... So how else do we know how to seek the true interpretation here? As the following saying, saying 4, says, we must go to the pile of seven days. We must, go, we must go to the beginning to come to this end. The end and the beginning are the same, and the end and the beginning reveal to us who we are. It reveals to us that we are the sons of the living Father, and it reveals to us the true, the, the true interpretation of these things of the Gospel of Thomas. It reveals to us what we're seeking, and we're seeking eternal life. And the, the answer to achieving eternal life is going to the beginning, which is also going to the end, and knowing who you are and coming to know you who you are you realize that you are the son of the father and to remain as the son of the father you must obey him and guard his his commandments you must guard his ways and by being the son of the father you will rule over the all so, that is the, um, let's see here, that is the, um, hold on a moment, I'm just going to quickly check something. I'm debating if I'm going to do another, another saying here. I realize I said I was only going to do two, but, uh, just to make it more smooth, I wanted to finish um, okay, so I might have enough time, let's see. Um, uh, okay, I'm going to try to do saying five and six. Saying five reads, Yahushua said, Recognize what is in your sight, and that which is hidden from you will become plain to you, for there is nothing hidden which will not become manifest. This is first the idea of, um, the things that are in our sight are hidden, but it will become plain to us if we recognize what it is. We will eventually recognize what it is, but we need to do that before the Judgment Day. Um, and that is further, further um, supported by the, further enhanced by the whole, the seven days where to know the beginning and the end is to recognize what is in our sight and is to recognize is to see what has been hidden from us the beginning and the end have been hidden from us but to, to come to see what that is for that to be manifest that is coming to know ourselves and recognizing what is in our sight recognizing what the beginning and the end is 
And as Messiah himself says, I am the beginning and the end. He, God, is the beginning and the end. So he, our origin, is the beginning and the end. And that is the meaning of all things. That's our purpose in life is to glorify him and to love him and to obey his righteousness. And so saying six says, his disciples questioned him and said to him, do you want us to fast? How shall we pray? Shall we give alms? What diet shall we observe? Yeshua said, do not tell lies and do not do what you hate. For all things are plain in the sight of heaven. For nothing hidden will not become manifest and nothing covered will remain without being uncovered. So that right there tells us that, all right, look, you need to amend your ways. Stop being evil and start being righteous. Because if you don't be righteous, then you will not come to know who you are. And you will not see the kingdom of God. You will not find the true interpretation of these things. You will not... The things that are obvious otherwise will not be made manifest to you. You will be in blindness. You will be lost in your wickedness and darkness. So, um, we should not concern ourselves with all these outward things. Well, rather, we should concern ourselves with the inner things. And the inner is what controls the outer. It's not the outer that controls the inner. And so, the inner also is hidden from the outside. But we must make it manifest by living righteously. That shows us shows others who we truly are. It shows others that we are sons of the living Father, We and that we acknowledge that and obey that. And that's the end of this video. Thank you and shalom. Shalom, this is Anayahu. In this video, I would like to discuss the, uh, the literal, uh, the literal fulfillment of parables. Now, this is a somewhat controversial subject because the implications are far-reaching, but it's an important truth that needs to be taught. And few, few are teaching this, but I am convinced that it is true. Now, many are of the opinion, especially the Christian church, that allegory allegorical interpretation of scripture is superior to the literal interpretation of scripture that it supersedes even and is it, it's superior and that the literal is inferior and in their opinion you might as well just throw away the literal meaning altogether because it's pretty much completely useless in their opinion however this is a complete flaw and is contrary to scriptures and contrary to morality that we throw out the literal meaning of God's word to us. So that's the, this is the um, point of my video. That, that's what I'm seeking to address. So with that said, allow me to begin. Um, <clears throat> So, what kind of teachings here are on the line when we're dealing with allegorical versus literal interpretation? Well, allow me to tell you. Um, basically, there's this so-called parable in the Gospel of Luke, which says that basically describes Lazarus and a rich man in a place called, in the Greek, Hades, though in Hebrew it would be Sheol. Sheol. So, many, because they do not agree and they do not like the implications of the actual existence of this type of place, refused to accept the little truth that the Messiah was teaching, and instead, they reinterpret it as allegorical, and they call it as 
it must not be actually true because it's a parable. So they use the parable to reject what the truth is. But this is also in flaw because for two reasons. First of all, it's very clear that it's not a parable. In one moment. And secondly, the other reason that it's flawed is because parables, every single parable, is a prophecy that is actually fulfilled. In other words, these stories that we are told in these parables are not just stories. They actually happened or they are going to happen. These are all prophecies. These parables are not myth, they're not allegory purely. They are pure, literal truth that actually is going to be fulfilled in addition to the allegorical interpretation. Do I have evidence for this? Yes, and I will get to that in a moment. So that's what I contend. Um, so anyway, that's um, that's one of them. So that basically they you they use that to justify that we we cease to exist after death by saying, oh, it's just a parable, and parables aren't aren't actually true. They're just false stories. They're fiction. They're, they're not nonfiction. But the truth is, parables are nonfiction. So now, what are what are two other teachings that are majorly significant, but that they reject because of their false use of parables? One of these teachings is the idea that plants are not moral agents, that plants are not sentient, that they're basically robots. Plants are lifeless and mindless. That's what most people believe. But there are parables in the throughout the scriptures which are very clear that plants are sentient beings but they reject these parables and say well it's just a parable so it's not actually true it's completely false because as i will show in one more moment but now we're going to get to the third third major teaching that they that they reject due to this false interpretation. In the book of Ezekiel, chapters 40 to 48, if you take it in context with the rest of scripture, you realize that a literal interpretation requires that a third temple, not a first or second temple, but the third temple of the Jews will be built and that the entire law of Moses must be kept after the Messiah died. Christians do not like this. They do not like the idea of having to obey the entire law of Moses after the Messiah died. Because supposedly the law of Moses was abolished because it was a burden to us. So why would God put a burden on us again when we were, we were freed from that bondage? Quote, unquote, bondage. Well, that's the idea. Oh, wait, wait a minute. If this is literally interpreted, then that means I have to keep the law of Moses? That means the law of Moses wasn't abolished by Messiah's death? then that must not be literal. That must be allegorical. See right there, they use that to twist things so they don't have to accept it. But that's completely flawed interpretation and it's biased and it's unfair and you're going to be punished for that kind of interpretation because that's not, that's not righteous interpretation. It's traditions of men that you cling on to. Now let me get to um, to, my, to proving this now. Here is a um, this is a similar concept to parable or allegory, and it's called a comparison. It might even be called a metaphor comparison. I'm not sure, but um, anyways, so this comparison is basically a parable, and it describes Benjamin the son of Jacob as a ravening wolf. Okay, so you know, that, that's fine. Benjamin is a ravening wolf, but let's ask the question. Would that comparison make any sense 
if wolves were never ravenous? No, of course not. The idea is that we're connecting two things. That this description, ravenous, is accurately describing Benjamin and the wolf. So we see that the wolf being ravenous is actually true. It's actually being fulfilled. Even though it's a parable symbolic, but it's still actually being fulfilled. It's fulfilled all the time when wolves are ravenous. And yet it's referring also to Benjamin being ravenous in his manner. Not necessarily Benjamin the man himself, but Benjamin's descendants, the sons of Benjamin. Now, another place we're going to read from is uh, the, the Gospel of Matthew. It reads this. This is the Messiah speaking. He says, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Right there. Wol sheep in the midst of wolves. In order for them to understand this connection, there has to be a, an ex a time where this actually happened, where they know that sheep were in the midst of wolves. So we see right there, that was an actual occurrence. It actually happened. And be as wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Other translations, I think, say innocent as doves. But so, harmless as doves. So right there. Well, they have to know what doves are like. And they have enough um, encounters with doves to know that they, generally speaking, are harmless. And the same thing with serpents. They are wise. Um, so these has to, in order for that to make sense, it has to be something that actually happens. Now let's read Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. It says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. So, right there. That's the connection between what Messiah said. Wise as a serpent. You know, that wise is connected to cunning, that idea. So right there, that's affirming the actual existence of wisdom or cunning in serpents. Okay. So... I have about five minutes left, but I'm pretty much done with this video. I'll hold on one moment. Another thing. The idea of a lion is sometimes used to refer to God, or the Messiah, which is God. Other times, the lion is used to refer to Satan in the New Testament, I believe, if I remember correctly. So we have two completely opposite ideas. One the good essence, and one evil. And, but the idea is that God is strong and courageous like a lion, and this other idea is Satan is you know, uh, mischievous and seeking to devour you, as someone evil would do. So it's a comparison, and in both cases, it's referring to something that is actually the case, it's actually true. Okay, so now here's a very oh, right, another another one more is um a child. Okay, the Messiah refers to a child. You must become like one of these in order to be saved. What he means is you must become innocent and trusting of the Father, the authority of that child, and have a faith in them, complete and total faith, in order to be saved. So that's something that actually is the case with children. And Paul says in his letters, you must cease to be children and you must become adults. And what he means is children are ignorant of more advanced truths. And this is true. Spiritual children and physical children are ignorant of greater truths. So you need to stop being children and become adults is what Paul says means and both refer to things that actually are the case now taken as a whole allegory is contradictory to itself because when you read a passage it the in, if you read the passage entirely allegorically it won't make sense and it contradicts because it has different allegorical meanings and it just isn't a whole um it also fails to account account for the intent of the author.
for writing the book in the first place, and it ignores the evidence of total sufficiency in logical interpretation of the of what the literal interpretation is. Because the when you read it literally, it all makes sense and it's completely sufficient. As opposed to when you're reading it allegory, allegorically, where it's all jumbled and doesn't flow. So it's it forces us to reject that logic, which is ridiculous. Another thing, the possibility of literal fulfillment. If you look at any of these parables, especially the ones the Messiah uses, like for instance the sheep, uh, he has a hundred sheep and one of them is lost. This is something that could actually happen. Look at any parable that Messiah uses and that's something that is actually able to exist. It is something that we can see. So that's the possibility of it. And then we, I'm claiming that with the possibility, we also know that it does actually, it has happened at least once. That's the truth. How do we know this? Because this is the final proof of this. Prophecy proves the fulfillment. Now remember I said the comparison only works if it's um, literal, if both are literally being fulfilled. As in with, the, you know, uh, wolves have to be actually ravenous, otherwise the comparison doesn't work. So, there is a parable that the Messiah makes that refers to uh, one of his, um, is a, the tenant of the vineyard, I think, and he leaves and he sends some servants and I think the um, the people who are working there uh, beat, beat up beat up the people he sends and then he says, you know, if I send my sli if I send my own son, then they're not going to beat him up. But then they beat him up, and oh, I'm the 15 minute mark. Sorry about that. I'll m mention it in the comments. Shalom. This is Annie Yahoo. I've actually decided to make one small second video uh, because I feel that the former video just didn't do this subject justice. So. Um, so let me read this final, I wanted to read this final quote and then do a proper explanation of what I was trying to say. Um, okay, so now I'm reading this from the Gospel of Thomas, but you can find this exact, exact, uh, saying, parable of the Messiah in Gospel of Matthew, in the Gospel of Mark, and in the Gospel of Luke. Okay. Um, and I'll tell you what those references are. Okay, you can find it in Matthew chapter 21, Mark chapter 12, and Luke chapter 20. Okay, you can find this parable in there. So this parable is the uh, saying number 65 of the Gospel of Thomas. It reads as follows, it says, He said, There was a good man who owned a vineyard. He leased it to tenant farmers so that they might work it and be, and he might collect the produce from them. He sent his servants so that the tenants might give him the produce of a vineyard. They seized his servant and beat him, all but killing him. The servant went back and told his master. The master said, perhaps did not, they did not recognize him. He sent another servant. The tenants beat this one as well. Then the owner sent his son and said, Perhaps they will show respect to my son. Because the tenants knew that it was he who was the heir to the vineyard, they seized him and killed him. Let him who has ears hear. So what does that saying refer to? That is a prophecy of the Messiah who is the son of the father, Yahuwah. And the son is also Yahuwah. That, anyways, um, so, that prophecy right there is referring to the son being sent into the world to be accepted by the people, but unfortunately, the people choose to reject the son. Okay? So, that right there, that's prophecy. He's intending this parable to be prophetic. However, remember I told you in the previous video about how with the case of Benjamin and the ravenous wolf, that, the, that, that that's a prophecy too right there. Benjamin will be a ravenous wolf. That only can be an actual valid prophecy 
if the description ravenous wolf is an actual occurrence in truth that if it actually is true is it true is it literal does it act did it actually happen yes otherwise the prophecy is not valid because it's not a accurate comparison in this case as well we find that this is an explicit parable and now we see wait a minute wow this saying about this tenant who sends his servant and then finally sends his son, this can only be prophetically true if, just like the case with Benjamin and the wolf, this story had to actually happen. It had to be something that has actually happened or will happen in the scope of time before the end of, of all things of this first age before the eternal age enters in. So, so this is something that has to be actually the case. Otherwise, the prophecy, in the same way as when I described with Benjamin and the wolf, in the same way, otherwise, if this parable did not literally happen, or is literally going to happen, then it's not a valid prophecy. So we see right here, I just proved that this parable I told you actually did happen or actually will happen. Or maybe it's happening right now. Okay, so this is what I have proven with this one parable. Now, when you go to the other parables, especially of the Messiah, you see that almost every single parable is a prophecy of a Messiah or a prophesying... It prophesies uh, what will happen if you do something. So, since, as I said, it actually has to be in existence, actually true and literal, otherwise it's not a valid prophecy, this proves that pretty much every single parable must have actually happened and is literal, completely literal in addition to the allegorical meaning because that is necessary for the for the uh, prophecy to be valid and there might be a few that aren't prophetic but the most of them are so I I definitely agree that I had not proven that every single parable has actually happened but I do believe I've proven that almost every single parable has happened. I do believe I also have proven that every parable can happen and could or could happen. But I also am contending that every parable did or is or will happen. And that this is not just this is not just a, a fictional fictional sayings, but these are actually historical truths that are being taught to us and preached. That's the force of these parables, otherwise they wouldn't make any sense. They're contingent upon the truthfulness and factuality of, uh, of their, the, these parables. Otherwise, yeah, so it wouldn't be fulfilled. It couldn't be fulfilled if it wasn't actually true. So with this truth that we have, now we, we have basically just crushed the opinion of many who use parables or allegories to reject the literal meaning of scripture so that they don't have to accept something as true. But now I've shown you that that is a illogical thing to do and is dishonest you um, study and approach to the text and it's just completely false so that that I have proven I believe sufficiently in this video that parables are completely literal and should be accepted and embraced as that and therefore those three teachings that I mentioned to you in addition to many other teachings you reject must now be accepted and not rejected otherwise you're being a hypocrite and those three teachings I will mention again are that there is life after death. We don't cease to exist. We, our souls don't 
sleep, there's no such thing as soul sleep, okay? So that's the first one that you guys reject, but because of this video and how I prove that parables can only be true and not false, um, if they're prophetic, that is, then that means that that one you must now accept, not reject. Secondly, you must now accept that plants are moral agents and have sentience. They are minds. They're not only humans are minds and sentient, but so also are plants. And the third one, the law of Moses, it was not abolished with Messiah's death. The law of Moses is not a burden, and the entire law of Moses will be kept during the millennial kingdom as prophesied and as commanded in the book of Ezekiel chapters 40 to 48 when you read the Tanakh and the rest of the scriptures in context. So, and that's after the Messiah's death. So, obviously he didn't abolish that with his death because it was a burden for us. Otherwise, he's putting us under burden again, and that would be no justification for that. It would be sending a mixed message to us completely, a contradictory message at that. So, those are the three major teachings that I have just refuted by... As long as we trust the if we trust the valid validity and authenticity of scripture, I have just refuted those three teachings because I have shown you that parables, for the most part, are 100% necessarily the case. They have to be things that not just only can happen, but actually do, uh, did, or will happen. Thank you for watching these two videos, and shalom.